He's the brother for the job. He loves to do it, but he loves to do it as a servant to meet God's people's needs. What a combination. Organization, but a heart for the needs of people. It's a good, I thank God for the, your team, Joe. All right, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. The Word of God, the singing of praises, and exalting of, the exalting of Christ. Colossians 3. 3.16. Let's look at it. I'll read 16 and 17. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. That's 15. Let's go to 16. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. I made my way through Colossians. What a great journey. It took about a year. It's around here. Four chapters in a year is typical. Uh, and I knew that these verses were coming. And I thought to myself... that it's important that we set forth our theology of the singing of praises. As one brother has already mentioned this morning, there's a lot of confusion in uh, even what you could call sham worship in the church. What does the Bible say about the singing of praises? First of all, I want to make this comment that we refer to it as the singing of praises, not to worship, as we'll see in a minute, because all of what we do is worship. Not only on Sunday morning, but all of life. Martin Jones emphasized that, and I picked it up from him, that the best way to refer to this is the singing of praises. It's the way the Psalms refer to it and the New Testament. So just to introduce it a little bit more. We are being exhorted in this text to be in practice what we are already in our nature by recreation. The new man. We are exhorted in, these, in this text and in this context to be in practice what we are already in our natures. New men, he refers to men and women as the new man. Remember 3.10? Put on the new self or the new man, which is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Notice the new man is a creation. That's the new birth. It's one of those verses that remind us of 2 Corinthians 5. If any man be in Christ, he's what? A new creation. So the new man is Paul's way of talking about the new creation, the, new, the regenerated believer. And then he says, adds to that in 11, a renewal in which there's no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, and barbarian and Scythian and slave and free man. But Christ is in all and Christ, Christ is all and in all. So what he's doing here is he's really exhorting us to be in practice what we already are, new creations, a new man. He says the new man is displayed in Christ-likeness and God-likeness because the new man, the, the recreated believer, was created in regeneration after God's likeness in 10b. Put on the new self who is being renewed in a true, to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. We were created in the new birth according to God's nature, his image. He recreated in us the properties that are in his nature. 
So, he's exhorting us, first of all, to be in practice what we are already in nature the new, as new men. Second, the new man is displayed in Christ-likeness and God-likeness because the new man was created after God's image with the same properties. In Ephesians 4.24, he refers to holiness and righteousness of truth. But what's interesting here is that a dominant element of the new man is the singing of praises to God. He goes on as he unpacks how the, the new man is to be in practice what we are in nature. He goes on to add this, these two verses about the singing of praises. Let the word of Christ dwell richly in you or within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So clearly, clearly in Paul's mind, a dominant element of the recreated, regenerated man, which is a generic term for men or women, is the singing of praises to God. Now, as I said, the singing of praises, he refers to it as singing, is a component of worship. Because for the believer, all of worship, all of life is worship. And I think we worshiped last night. Our, our, the, the apex of our worship last night was when we heard the word of God. And then we responded in the singing of praises. That's one of the reasons we began to do a song after the word. If the word of God is the apex of worship, then shouldn't we respond in the singing of praises in response to that? And that's why we started doing that about 15 years ago. We would sit there like we would have last night after something like that and thought to each other, this isn't the time to chat. Let's praise him. So we started putting a song after the sermon. That's why we did it. It was part of our theology of what it means to sing praises, as we're going to see in a minute. As I said, we have actually thought about what we do here. Even where the band is, everything has been thought about. We know we're living in a church culture that abuses the singing of praises, let alone the singing of, let alone worship. So, fourthly, by way of introduction, Paul here shows that the singing of praises are the direct result of the word of Christ dwelling in his people. 16. Let the word of Christ richly dwell in you. That's a verb. All the others are participles. So the dominant reality is that the word of God, which he calls the word of Christ here, is dwelling in people. And as it dwells in people, they sing. Grammatically, that's how it's structured. Because the verb that rules the verse is Christ dwelling in us. And all the others are participles that are governed by the main verb. So what he's saying is, is when the word of God dwells in his people, Centered around Christ is how I take it here. They will sing. Now this reminds us of John 4. Those who worship the Father must worship him, what? In spirit and truth. It starts with the what? Truth. There's no issue about that. That's a non-negotiable. But as the word of God dwells, centered here, I believe Paul is saying, around Christ, it will have an effect. There will be the singing of praises. So I'm with Luther on this. The word of God is the central reality. But inseparable from it. And an effect of it. And the mark that God is working mightily through it is the singing of praises. So pastors... 
must take it serious. I've watched so many men say, I preach around here, I don't bother with the music. You don't. You don't bother with the singing of praises. God bothers with the singing of praises. And if our oversight is over the whole congregation as elders, wouldn't one of the main oversights be, tell me, the singing of praises? I've watched guys come here. Not too many anymore because I don't ask them to come back. Where I look over and they never sing. I said, he's a bad example. You're a bad example. You've never looked up. You've never sung praise. If the Word of God is richly dwelling in you, why aren't you singing praises? Did I just say that? All right. Five things about the singing of praises from this text. First, there is a connection between the singing of praises, the Word of God, and the Gospel of Christ. Let the Word of Christ richly dwell within you. Then the participles follow, which modify and come and are governed by that main verb. So, first, there's an emphasis here that the written word of God, exalting and centered on Christ, is the root of the singing of praises. He says so. Let the word of Christ richly dwell in you with all wisdom and teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns, singing. So you can, we can discuss the participles, admonishing and teaching in a bit later. But we know that singing as they all three are, are governed by the rich word of Christ dwelling in you. There's no doubt about that grammatically. So the emphasis is that the word of God, exalting and centered on Christ, spawns the singing of praises. Now why, why do I say it that way? Paul says, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. Henderson translates it, the Christ word. Well, think about the book of Colossians, the unpacking of the glory of the supremacy and then the sufficiency of Christ in Colossians. That's got to be in mind. That amazing description of him in chapter 1. Look at it, remember? The image of the invisible God. He images God entirely. Because he is God. He's the eternal son who shares the father's nature. Entirely his equal. Then he's the creator of everything in 16. Delegated by the father. Yes, commissioned by the father. Purposed by the father. But he's the agent who acted to bring the universe into existence. Yes. Think about it. Then. 17. He's before everything, which makes him eternal. And he holds everything together on top of everything else. But this person became the head of the church, as we heard last night amazingly. But it goes further. The Father, it was the Father's pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and he's going to say in chapter 2, in bodily form. And then he accomplishes this amazing reconciliation in 20. Through him to reconcile all things to himself. That's where the death of Christ has ramifications for the whole universe. 21. And here's the particular redemption. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, active enemies of his, yet he's now reconciled you. Notice, you're already reconciled. There's the completed, accomplished redemption. There's not a process of reconciliation going on. You are reconciled. How perfectly? How? By what means? In his fleshly body. Through the sufferings he experienced in his body through death. How perfect is the reconciliation? He's now able to present you before him. How? Holy, blameless, and beyond reproach. That's how perfect 
the reconciliation is. That's how perfect the accomplishment is. Paul goes on to say much more about Christ, the circumcision of Christ, the regeneration of the new creature in 2 and 3, much more. This despoiling of the devil and the breaking of the dominion not only of sin in us, but Satan's sin power over us. Okay, and he gets to chapter 3. Let that word about Christ dwell in you and you will sing praises. You guys following it? But we can add to this. It's not only Colossians. Was it not announced from the beginning of Scripture that Christ is the theme of Scripture? Weren't we told right out the gate what the revelation of God would be about? I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He, he, this seed of the woman is going to crush your head, destroy you. You will bruise him on the head, but he will crush you on yours. So right out the gate, we are told that Scripture is about Christ. Christ asserted it. Didn't he assert that he was the theme of the Scriptures? Doesn't he say in John 5, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, but these testify about me. Doesn't he say in Luke, doesn't it say in Luke from the beginning with Moses and all the prophets, every one of them, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the Scriptures. Now he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. All the three major categories of Scripture, which covers all revelation, they're about me. That, has, that makes a statement about the Song of Solomon, doesn't it? That's not just a marriage manual. It can't be. Because he says, they're all about me. Okay, all I'm trying to say is for Paul to refer to Scripture as the Word of Christ should not be startling to any of us. He couldn't conceive of Scripture apart from Christ. But in addition, we have the revelation of the supremacy and sufficiency of Christ in Colossians. So the emphasis here is that the written Word of God exalts and centers on Christ. That's the connection between the singing of praises and the word of God and the gospel of Christ. But something else about this connection. There is an empowering, controlling influence in the word of Christ in people. It dwells in them. Let the word of Christ dwell in you. Dwell is not just oikoi, oikos, to dwell. It's katoikos, or katoikeo. It emphasizes the settledness of it and therefore the controlling influence of the presence from within. Karoikeo refers to a dwelling that has a controlling influence from within. Paul says in Romans 7, it's no longer I that I'm doing it, but sin which karoiko is in me. There's still a remaining sin in me that at times controls me. Paul says, the word of Christ gets in a man, it gets in a woman, and it begins to govern and control. And one of the effects of it, thirdly, is the singing of praises. So, if a man's preaching the word of God and preaching Christ, he should begin to think that this church is going to start singing unless I'm stifling it. Unless I'm stifling it in, because of some theological category that's not biblical. All right. Something about this connection as well. I'm talking about this connection between singing and the Word of Christ. The evidence of the Spirit's presence and power is manifested in singing. Not just the evidence of the Word. Why? Go back to Ephesians. 
Why would we say that as well? Because in Ephesians 5, it says, you guys know this. What is it? Be filled with the Spirit in 18. So the Spirit's involved. He's filling His people. And when He's filling His people, in 19, what do they start doing? They speak to one another, and what else do they do? Sing! They make melody in the hearts of the Lord. And they speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So in, notice the parallel. When the Spirit is dwelling and influencing and empowering and controlling, they're singing. In Colossians, when the Word is controlling and empowering, they're singing. You guys see it? They're not separate. It's the simple fact that the Spirit works through the Word of Christ. So, two things compel the singing of praises to be manifested in a ministry. First, the Word of Christ itself when it grips us. Second, the Spirit Himself in us will compel us to sing that way. Because the Spirit came to do what? Glorify Christ. And one of the ways He'll do it is cause His people to sing praises. Now someone says, why does this church sing this way? I don't know. Not, there's nothing in anything about the leadership other than this. We knew that when Christ gets in people, they start singing. We knew that the Spirit will compel them to sing. And we also knew that we don't want to do anything to hinder their singing. Because he loves the singing of praises. Okay. As I said, fifthly, regarding this connection. The effect of the word of Christ, the word of God about Christ dwelling in God's people is manifested in the singing of Christ-centered praises. The Spirit will work through the word to compel the singing of praises, which means... He, wouldn't he also, and I believe I can show you this, compel the writing and composing of what can be sung in praise? You would expect, and this is history, and I'll show it to you, you would expect that when the Word of God burst about Christ, burst on someone, and they're gripped with the glories of His person and work, and the Spirit's compelling it, wouldn't you expect there to be new songs sung. I love the old hymns. You can tell we sing them. But to say that God stopped producing great music in the 18th century is to say that the Spirit is no longer working and the Word is no longer gripping a heart. And if you say that, you could be impeding what the Spirit is actually doing. It took me a while to see that. Believe me. It took me a while to see that. Now, the scripture emphasizes, in fact emphasizes, that new songs are the result of a heart gripped by the truth of Christ's glorious person and work. The scripture actually says it. In the Dictionary of New Testament Theology, Colin Brown, great tool, he says this, A hymn of praise or the singing of praises is a typical manifestation either of the Spirit of God in his present activity or of God himself. This will include free compositions and new Christian songs. I don't think he had a bone to pick when he wrote that 30 years ago. He was treating Colossians. Now, let me give you some verses about new songs. Sing to the Lord a new song. He's done wonderful things. So the singing of a new song comes out of the realization of the wonder of the things he's done. His right hand and his holy arm have gained the victory for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. 
He's revealed His righteousness because in salvation He reveals the righteousness that saves. That's one of the wonders. And He's done it in the sight of the nations. He's going to save amongst the nations. He's remembered His loving kindness, His faithfulness. He says, sing a new song. Uh, Psalm 98, 1 through 3. That's what I think's happened with the revival of Reformed theology, with a cross-centered, Christ-centered, God-centered focus. What's come about the last 20 years? You tell me. This spontaneous spawning of these songs. That's what Colossians says will happen. Now, rightfully, they should be theological. They should be truth-based. That's why he said, let the word of Christ dwell in you first. That's why so much of the music written in the 60s and 70s and even early 80s was so trite. The heart might have been right, but there was no theological fuel. The word of Christ in his person and work, wasn't there. But when he's there, you can expect the new songs. We sang, Arise, my, Oh My Soul Arise last night. Who remembers that song? That's Charles Wesley, man. Retooled by Sovereign Grace. And then we sang, All I Have is Christ. That's not a retooling. That's about a six-year-old song written by a 19-year-old sinner. A new Wesley. It's Colossians. So, we don't want to stifle the Spirit by saying only in the 18th or 17th century or even the 16th was the Spirit producing Christ-exalting singing of praises. Do we want to do that? No. Now, that's the first point. My points are getting shorter. There is a connection. Firstly, there's a connection between the singing of praises and the word of Christ. Second, here we go. Here we go. Second, there are categories of songs with differing focus in the singing of praises. There's categories of songs. Look at Colossians 3. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns. Grammatically, you can connect teaching and admonishing with the psalms and hymns, or it can be separate and independent. I'm going to make it connected to the singing. I think they are grammatically connected and they all are governed by the Word of Christ. So what that means is, is they're teaching and admonishing in the singing. That's back to having truth in the singing, see? That's another way of saying there's got to be truth in the singing. Okay, and you guys, we've sung some songs that have been amazing. Whatever you think about the style, you can't argue that there's not truth in them. Now, categories. There they are. What are they? Three of them. Songs, what's it say? Hymns, psalms, hymns, spiritual song. Twelve, eighteen 18 years ago, a brother told me, I think we should just sing hymns. And another brother came along and said, I think we should just sing songs. Well, I'm sitting there thinking, these guys know the Bible. I wonder why they think that way. Maybe they're right. I said that to myself privately. <laughs> I don't admit you're right publicly. But it got me thinking. So they gave me a book by some great reform men on... Worship. And I read it. And I read, what's his, his dear brother, John Murray, the great legendary John Murray, who I thank God for. And I said, okay, John, show me why you sing not only just hymns, 
but in your case, just Psalms. Please show me! Well, I read it and said, I don't see it, John. Where's the exegesis? Well, that, that, I'm just telling you my response. So I wondered what he do with Colossians and Ephesians. John, there's three kinds of things, songs there. There's hymns, excuse me, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Can't you read your Bible? <laughs> well, I read John Murray and he said, Steve, through the text, Psalm, there's only one category. There's not three. This is a reformed take. There's one category, psalms. Within the psalms are two subcategories, hymns and spiritual songs. Oh, wow. So, you can imagine when I got to Colossians 3 this time, I tried to do my homework. I don't agree with my beloved friend who's now with Christ. I don't know him, but he's a friend because he's a believer. So let's look at this. I believe there are three categories here. First, there are songs about God's person and works sung accompanied by instruments. Where did I get that? Because Reformed people say there's no instruments in the New Testament. Really? Psalms means to sing a song accompanied by an instrument. I'll, I'm going to try to show that to you. The emphasis and meaning of the term psalmos, psalmos, is to sing a song about anything, actually, but in the Old Testament, in the New. It's about, it comes out of the culture, by the way. It's not a biblical word. Psalmos was a Greek term of Greek secular culture. It's not a biblical term. Psalmos. Listen to it carefully. Can you hear an English word? Get rid of the P. Psalm. Song. Psalm is their word for song. And it wasn't just a biblical word. It came right out of the Greek culture. I'll show you that in a minute. It was their word for a song. Well, God's people had their songs. They had their psalmos. They even had a book of their songs. Their psalmos, right? But the Greeks had psalms. It just means songs. In secular Greek, New Testament Dictionary of, uh, Dictionary of New Testament Theology. In secular Greek, solo, psalmos, is used from Homer onwards. Homer, in the Greek world onwards. Originally meaning to pluck even the hair, but it came to mean to pluck a bowstring, then to pluck a harp or any other stringed instrument. That's what solo meant. Pluck a stringed instrument in accompaniment of a song. Give me a, let me give you an example. That's from the dictionary by Colin Brown. Listen to this. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you. Let them seek a man, a skillful player on the harp. And the New Septuagint uses solo. To solo the harp with his hand and all will be well when they brought in David to sing to Saul. So there it's used there. A psalm was a general term for songs accompanied by stringed instruments. That's what it meant. So Paul is echoing the book of Psalms. He's not saying like John Calvin did, and I can quote him, but I don't have time. I can quote him at length that we've outgrown the stringed instruments. They were part of the infant church in its infancy. Paul apparently is not agreeing because he uses the word solo, string, uh, sing a song on a stringed instrument, which echoes the book of Psalms and its emphasis on singing in God with a stringed instrument. I would say this. If you come to the point that you shouldn't have stringed instruments... You can't dogmatize and you must tolerate those that use them. And if God allows the invention of electricity, <laughs> the Bible doesn't say you can't channel the electricity into the instrument. <laughs> Somebody is holier than God.
You say, where are you going to get the verse? You say, but there's a bad association with stringed instruments with electricity in them. Then sanctify not only the instruments, sanctify the instrument players. Sanctify it. Don't get rid of it. Or you might just be a reactionary. Now see, I thought about this stuff. Are we just going to be reactionaries? What does the Word of God say? Okay. Where are we, Steve? Let's see. This says page 24. This says page 28. <laughs> Did some kind of nefarious creature from your church come up here and take the rest of my notes. Okay. That's crazy. Okay. I'm, I'm, on, I'm on the right page. Here we go. Solo was a common term, term in the Greek world for a song accompanied by instruments. Psalmos and solo are not biblical words. They became biblical words. Just like all our New Testament words came out of the culture and were redefined. So the world had its psalmos, its songs. God's people had their psalmos. Get this. Solo, psalmos, was a common term in the Greek word, world for a song accompanied by instruments. It was used even, get this, in Psalm 69, quoted in Matthew 11, of the songs sung by drunkards who mocked Christ. Get this. Those who sat in the gate uh, talk about me, and I'm the song, I'm the solos, the psalmos of drunkards. You see how it's part of their culture. And it meant to string an instrument, to strum an instrument. Now, here's what's interesting with that in mind. The exhortations of Scripture are to, in fact, use instruments. Sing for joy in the Lord, O you righteous ones. Praises becoming to the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with lyres. Sing praises to Him with a harp of ten strings. Use stringed instruments. Sing to Him a new song. There it is again. Allow the Word of God to compel you to spawn your own Singing of praises and adoration. Play skillfully with the shout of joy. Psalm 33, 1 through 3. It enhances the joy and festive nature of worship. Yes, I said festive nature of worship. I said that out loud. Who redefined reverence as being void of joy. You see my point? Who came along and defined reverence in a... Ne I'm, I'm all for reverence. Of course. You can be giddy. You can be over-familiar. You can be trite. I have no trouble with that. That's a true criticism. But is joyfulness, a festive joyfulness, not reverential? if it's really the expression of gratitude. As I said, I think some people are holier than God. Now, i got to show you that from Scripture. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty expanse. Praise Him for the mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with harp and lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. That's bodily movement in its root meaning. Doesn't mean you got to get out in the aisle. But it means if you move a little bit, like one of our speakers, he's still okay. I, I don't think he's here. Or he soon won't be. <laughs> I feel the same way. 
but there, there has to be decency and order. The Bible re regulates that stuff, doesn't it? You start disturbing everybody, get yourself together! <laughs> right? Get yourself together. You're not that spiritual. You just think you are. And you're showing off what you think is spirituality, and we all think you're a buffoon. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm saying some things out loud that I can't believe are coming out, but that... <laughs> okay, I'm not, I want to really get into this, and I'm only introducing it. <laughs> Praise Him with loud symbols. Praise Him with resounding symbols. That's amazing. Somebody said, how loud is loud? Great question. We have to decide that. I think it can be too loud. Is there a biblical principle? Of course there is. It's in Colossians. You can be too loud. Don't let me forget it. I'll get to it in a minute. <laughs> the examples that are of songs written and sung with instruments by the people of God or for the people of God is the book of Psalms. Today, there should be new songs that express the word of Christ. You see, Christ hadn't come in full revelation. Paul says, let your singing be an expression of the revelation of God, of the fullness of the revealed Christ. If we sing just psalms, we don't have the fully revealed Christ. Here's the dictionary again by Colin Brown. Dictionary of New Testament Theology. When Christ takes hold of a heart, his word there will be, out of, through his word, there will be new songs. This is, not, that's an intro into the quote. Here's now Colin Brown about new songs. Such songs are also mentioned in the famous letter of the younger Pliny. Remember Pliny, the governor of Turkey, Asia Minor, writing to the emperor in response to the request to persecute Christians about 110 A.D., this is still existing. The younger Pliny writes, quote, the Christians meet to sing a song to Christ as to a God. They wrote new songs. Now, that's the first song. Psalmos. Now the second category. Psalms, then what's next? Hymns. Okay, that's second. There are songs that extol explicit attributes, specific attributes and works of God. That's a humnos. Humnos. Hymns. Humnos came right out of the Greek culture. That isn't a Bible word. It became a Bible word. The Greeks used it all the time. It had an explicit meaning. The emphasis of the word hymn, humnos, is to sing a song that celebrates, recites, tells of a specific attribute or work of someone. That's the meaning of a humnos. Great is thy faithfulness. It is well. The glories of Calvary. By sovereign grace. Yes, it's a hymn. You say, but the music doesn't sound like a hymn. You don't define a hymn by the instrumental accompaniment. Let me tell you what you're doing. You define a hymn, what you do. You define a hymn by, does it recite, celebrate specific attributes and works of God? That makes it a hymn. It was a common term used in the Greek world. It was used of lauding or praising their gods. It focused on the content of the song, not the style. It was used of the song of the Philippines, Philistines to sing their praise of their god Dagon. Listen to this. The Philistines used this word, humnos, to celebrate the virtues of Dagon. Now the lords of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon their god and to rejoice. For they said, our god has given Samson our enemy into our hands. So they recited in this hymn to Dagon the attributes and works of Dagon who they attributed the death of Samson to. So a hymn 
was a common term that was written to recite the attributes of someone or something. See? Now here's what we do. We decide a hymn by musical style. You know what that's called? Traditionalism. That's not biblical. That's not how you define a hymn. You say, wait a minute, that's a hymn. I want the old hymns. And you pull something out of the songbook that's really not even a hymn. But it's old, so that makes it a hymn. <laughs> see what I mean? I started to see this. People aren't even thinking in biblical categories. A humnos is the reciting of attributes. We sang the glories of Calvary two days ago. That's a hymn. You say, but it's got all those guitars and it kind of moves. It's a hymn. Define your songs by the Word of God. Or you're a traditionalist. I saw this stuff, brothers. I saw. These guys aren't defining their words by the Bible. Okay. There's many examples in Scripture of the use of hymns. Whom not? In the book of Psalms. Sometimes the book of Psalms will say, Sing a psalm, song, and it's psalmos. Sometimes it'll say, sing a song, and it's humnos. Shout joyfully to God all the earth. That would be in the Septuagint, of course, the Greek translation. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your works. Because of the greatness of your power, your enemies will give feigned obedience to you. He's specifying God's works his greatness, his power, and he uses humnas. King Hezekiah and the officials ordered the Levites to sing a, a, a humnas, a hymn to the Lord with the words of David and Asaph, the seer. So they sang humnas with joy and bowed down and worshiped in Second Chronicles with the rededication of the temple. It's all over the place. The song that Christ sang to the Father, praising God for the redemption accomplished through his death, prophesied in Psalm 22. I will proclaim your name to my brethren in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your humnas. I will sing your praises. The song sung by Paul and Silas in the jail were humnases. On and on and on. The song sung in celebration of the return of the ark in First Chronicles was a homnos. They wrote specific lyrics to sing praises to God for his attributes and his works in having the ark return. It always refers to songs sung that recite and celebrate God's attributes and works. Then, okay, one more category. Spiritual songs. Colossians 3 there again, you see it in verse 17. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Now, spiritual songs. The Greek word is ode. There's very few m people in this room old enough to remember this. There was a song in the late 60s called The Ode to Billy Joe, to Bobby Joe or something. I can't remember. <laughs> Don't raise your hand to admit you know that song. <laughs> it was a, an account of this experience, this tragedy. Catchy tune. Many of the psalms were odes because of the headings. The heading of 36 psalms from Psalm, excuse me, 36 different psalms from Psalm 18 to 134 would say not a psalmos, but an odes. 
it pointed out that this particular song will focus on the author's experience of God's attributes. So God's attributes are still in the song, but the attributes, not objectively speaking, but what? As experienced by the author. I'll give you some examples. Songs of provision and protection. From there they continued to beer. That is the well where the Lord said to Moses, assemble the people that I may give them water. Then Israel sang this ode, this song. It's odes. It's the word here in Colossians. Here's the song. Spring up, O well. I don't know if that's the title or the song. The well which the leaders drank, sank, which the nobles of the people dug. Spring up, O well. And because God provided them water, they wrote a, an odes of their own experience of God making the provision. Now, there's odes of deliverance written about God delivering. This is in Exodus 15. Then Moses, this is after the deliverance at the Red Sea. Then Moses and the sons of Israel sang this ode to the Lord, not Samos, not Humnos, and said, I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider, he's hurled into the sea. That was a song. The Lord is my strength, <coughs> excuse me, and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will extol him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. That's their ode. Now, somebody asked me yesterday. I guess there's a leading evangelical, reformed evangelical, that says you should never say I in a song. Have you guys ever heard at least that suggested? Raise your hand. Okay. Well, then Moses has a big problem. <laughs> I will sing to the Lord, for he's highly exalted. You've got an inspired song by Moses where he says I in it. Okay? <laughs> Deal with it. Now, I realize subjective praise is wrong. I realize myopic, self-centered praise is wrong. So if we do say that, it must have within it the works of God that cause you to say it. But to just across the board say you can't say I or we, you don't have a biblical precedent because the psalmist does it seven or eight times. So it's a matter, isn't it, of making sure, not that we say I, but that it's not trite and shallow. Correct? But don't we swing out there? Or are you perfectly sanctified? I could go on and on. David singing and dancing before the ark. Okay, those are the three categories of songs. Now, next point, third point in Colossians. Let's look. <clears throat> 16. Wow. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. And that's the governing verb. When it does that, consequently you can translate these participles consequent participles or result of participles, however you want to say it, resulting in teaching and admonishing in the singing or separate, whichever way you land on that, but it doesn't matter because the singing is clearly resultant of the word of Christ dwelling in you. Then in the end of the verse, with thankfulness in your hearts to the Lord, that is utterly critical, the last phrase. That explains why we put the band here and why they want to be here. It's not sin if they're up here. They could be up here. There's good men that have them up here. So don't go jumping on people. But we had to make a decision. Let me look at it again. Singing and making melody with thank well, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to the Lord. So, the third point about the singing of praises in the Word of Christ, 
There's a conscious directing of the singing of our praises to God, not to each other. There's an acknowledgement and adoration of God, sung to God because of who He is and what He's done. Now, that's why we felt there's a risk, at least in our culture, but maybe not in some places, that instrumentalists might become an attraction. And then we're no longer singing to who? God. Now, I know this actually happens when they start projecting instrumentalists on screens. I can't do that. My conscience. You have to, I, I cannot do it. Because who am I singing to? Who's my focus to be on? According to this verse. God. Why is this rock star on the screen? Do you guys see it? But don't go jumping on guys that have instrumentalists on the stage like a famous preacher in Minneapolis. <laughs> I think he's a God-centered man, don't you? I'm just telling you why we decided to do it this way. But notice something else about when is it too loud. Look at it. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing. I take the teaching and admonishing to be connected with the singing. Which means I have to hear what's being sung for the singing to admonish me. Which means the instruments cannot drown out the singing. Somebody says, well, you get a little bit loud here sometimes. And I ask the brother, can you still hear the singing? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Well, then we're still, we're still within the scriptural parameters. You've got to hear the singing. There's some churches, my son sent me a, on his cell phone, a video of a church service in Northern Cal here of, must be 7,000 people in this church. He says he was amazed because he said, listen, all you can hear is the band. Nobody's singing. See what I mean? Wait a minute. We're to be singing to the Lord. Don't drown out the singing. You guys see what I'm trying to say? So, we bring, we bring instruments and the hymns we sing under the Word of God, but we don't react by saying it can't be exuberant, it can't be stringed instruments, and it can't have electricity in it. No, it can have electricity in it. I'll tell you this, there's some pianists and some strings instrument in some churches that aren't assisted with electricity that ought to resign because they're that bad. What about playing skillfully? So the... The question is, we've got to do it in a way that Christ stays at the center. Amen? He's got to stay at the center. Both in the lyrics and in the way it's sung. That they, they can be exuberant, they simply can't drown out what we're singing. And I don't have to tell you that these guys are more driven by this than me. Believe me. They are word-driven, Christ-driven men. That's another thing. you got to get guys in, the, in this ministry that see these things and see the theology. Or you're going to get some guy that wants to be a rock star. Oh, you've never had that problem. I have. But I laid down my guitar... And realize, I just can't do this. <laughs> so, last thing here. There's an acknowledgement, and I said this already, an adoration of God. I'm gone too long, I think. Maybe not. You know, I just don't care. <laughs> I just don't. Care. Okay. There's an acknowledgement and adoration of God 
sung to God because of who he is. That's what I've already said. Go to Revelation 5. This is worship in heaven. And Jonathan Edwards is right. The blessed place to decide the great, the pattern for worship is it's where it's done most purely. And where would it be done most purely? In heaven. So let's look. He took the book, and 8 and 9, they sang a new song. Oh, no! You can't write new songs! <laughs> they sang a new song. Saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. You were slain. Is that a Christ-centered song? And purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation and made them to be kingdom. And look at 11. I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And the number was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. Brothers, that means tens of millions. Saying with a loud voice, Oh no, you're getting too loud. They're loud. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power. And then 14, the living creatures kept saying, Amen. Two things. It was exuberant. Three things. It was Christ-centered, gospel-driven. It was exuberant. And it was all directed to Christ. And it could be heard. One last thing. This is B, under a conscious directing of our singing to God. This is a marvel to me. There should be an anticipation of God's presence drawing near to us through the singing of praises. Did you hear me? That he will draw near with a sense of his presence through the singing of praises in response to the word. Why do I say that? Listen to this. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Start singing. Shout, O Israel. Sing. Watch this. I'll tell you where it is in a minute. Rejoice and exult with all your heart. Exuberance, heartfelt, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He's cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You see, they're singing, and he says he's in the middle of you because you're singing from your heart. He's in your midst. And you shall, never again, you shall never again fear evil. On that day it will be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst. A mighty one. Watch this. He will save you. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you in his love. He's going to exult over you. He is, God is, with loud singing. You sing, he sings back. Now, pastors, is the reason your church doesn't sing is you have a low esteem of the glory of God in the singing of praises. And we have found that many pastors and many churches don't teach their pastors and elders the high priority of the singing of praises. And they stifle it with a conscience that's not ruled by the Word of God, but often rule, ruled by tradition. So that's my thimbleful. I'm done. Let me pray and we're going to sing. Let's stand. Lord, you love the singing of praises. It's like a wife that loves notes. Love notes. You, you love your people to sing from their hearts to you. And you encourage them to use instrumentation. 
But we know it must be truth-driven. We know this. We know that the instruments can't drown out the, the praise. And that man can't creep in and be the sinner. 